Today's episode was a lot of fun. I had Chris Hutchins on, who is one of the very few people who's actually sold his company to Google and then worked for Google Ventures, helping them acquire other startups. He oversaw over 300 different startups during his time. And I picked his brain on what it would look like for me to start a new company and pitch it to VCs like Google and see uh, you know, if I could get a new tech company started. So it was a great interview on that front. We also talked about different kind of hacks that you can do in life. There's some really cool ones that I hadn't heard of yet. Uh, where you can save a lot of money and uh, still live the lifestyle you want to live. So make sure you stay till the end. Now let's jump in the episode. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? My company, Future Flipper, can help. We've taught hundreds of people all over the country how to flip, wholesale, and buy rental properties. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your investing journey. Whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your company, Future Flipper can help. We have courses, coaching, and events for all levels of investors. So if you want to take the next step, go to futureflipper.com and book a free consultation to see how we can best help you. Once again, that's futureflipper.com. If you've ever wanted to invest with me on my real estate deals, it's now possible. At Pineda Capital, we're purchasing value-add real estate all across the country. This includes multifamily, commercial, and land development. The best part is, with my network, social media presence, and marketing strategies, we're able to get the very best deals that others don't have access to. You can join in with me on those deals if you're an accredited investor. If you want to learn more, head over to PinedaCapital.com to see our current opportunities. Once again, that's PinedaCapital.com. Welcome to The Ryan Pineda Show. Where our mission is to invest. I only expect to make money in things that I understand. Innovate. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And inspire. I am much more likely to hit my goal just due to putting it out there. You're now rocking with the best. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Ryan Pineda Show. Today, we've got somebody from the tech world that uh, I really want to talk to because... I'm getting very deep into tech. I've been reading a lot of books about VCs and just how they raise money and build these startup companies. So I figured I'd bring on an expert who started multiple companies, one of which ended up selling to Google and then subsequently working for Google in their venture capital firm. So, uh, you know, I'm really excited for this episode, guys. Uh, I have none other than Chris Hutchins. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So Chris, we actually got linked up by Wealthfront, which yep. is uh, somebody who sponsored uh, me in the past. And they said, hey, you got to meet Chris. He's the uh, head of new product ideas. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I came to Wealthfront after uh, winding down my last company and kind of the entire company came over to Wealthfront. And you know, I've been working on a lot of different products. And, and for those who don't know, Wealthfront's goal is to build investing and banking products to make it really easy to build your wealth. And so I'm in charge of new product strategy and trying to figure out what those next big things we're going to do are and, and what kinds of products we can build for people to make their lives easier and help them make more money. Yeah, man. So, you know, Wealthfront's super cool. Um, you and I were talking off camera a little bit about your story coming into this. And man, you've kind of lived that startup founder life um, that people like romanticize about, it seems like. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, when I graduated college, I didn't even know that Silicon Valley was a thing. And I actually was a little late to the game. A lot of people I'd met from high school were telling me that they had their jobs lined up and I had no clue what was going on. So I went back to college. I said, I need to find a job. I heard the best jobs were in management consulting, and investment banking. I told the dean of the business school, I said, hey, I need a job in one of these industries. And so uh, he introduced me to a couple companies. I did the interviews. I got a couple jobs. One of them actually started nine months after graduation. So I picked both of them. Um, and I got, got to go in, into this kind of weird corporate world. And it wasn't until about 18 months later, I went to an event where called Startup Weekend where people build startups. And I was like, that's it. This is what I want to do the rest of my life. Yeah. So what happened after that? So I almost immediately, so I was in New York, went to this event startup weekend in New York, and I was like, this is amazing. We built some silly app. Uh, and so I was like, we got to do this again. So I went to the one in Boston like a month later, and I was like, this is so cool. I put in a transfer request at the company I worked at, and I said, can I move to San Francisco? 
And, you know, for me, it was, I want to be where this is happening. People told me, oh, you like this? There's a whole city where people just do this for a living. <laughs> I was like, I have to live there. And so uh, fortunately at the time, uh, my wife didn't love her job. And so we were like, where should we go? And I was like, San Francisco, we got to go to San Francisco. So we moved out there and I made it a goal uh, to really immerse myself in this whole world. And I guess fortunately, though at the time, very unfortunately, about a month after moving there, I got laid off. Uh, it was the end of 2008, the financial crisis. I was someone who had just moved cities. I wasn't assigned any team. And I was like, well, I got to make a name for myself and figure things out. And so I started a conference called Laid Off Camp and did end, ended up doing 20 of them around the country. And, and it turned <laughs> <Laid> off camp. <laughs> yeah, we, we were getting together people who had gotten laid off, didn't have jobs, didn't know what to do. And what was great about it was that in 2008, the only people hiring were tech companies. So when we held these events and we were looking for sponsors, we were looking for people who wanted to meet unemployed people to hire them, they were all tech companies. So I got to know all the sponsors. I got to build relationships, got to build relationships with them. Yeah. And we ended up having a few sponsors. I worked for them. I did freelance work and I just got to know everyone. And I kind of really immersed myself in that world. Right. So you ended up going through this. You're in San Fran. You have no job. Pretty expensive to live out there. <laughs> it is not a cheap city. Yeah. But this was kind of like your first entrepreneurial endeavor doing these laid off camps. Yep. You know? So when did you end up starting your first company? Yeah. So I always tell people laid off camp was like an organization. It wasn't a company and that right. like, we didn't really make money when we took sponsor dollars and we bought pizza and we <laughs> rented venues. And, um, yeah, I think I might've made enough to fly to a couple of the events that happened around the country, but it wasn't until, so I, after that, I, um, I did a bunch of freelance work. I worked for a startup and helped them create a fundraising deck. I worked for another startup and, and was like building some software as, which I'm not an engineer and I shouldn't have been able to do, but I, that's what they wanted to pay me to do. Um, I also, uh, worked for a company and helped them plan events like laid off camp, but I took a quick pause and, and we could just kind of jump through it quick. My wife and I were like, gosh, you hate your job. I'm unemployed. Should we take a trip before we really jump back into things? And we ended up taking an eight month trip, backpacking around the world. We spent all of our money. <laughs> um, but on that trip, I got accepted to speak at South by Southwest. And so I, I ended the trip in Austin, went to South by, and I was like, my mission is to find the next big company. And that was, I wouldn't say entrepreneurial, it was an entrepreneurial spirit, but at the time it was join a company. And I joined this company that I thought was gonna be the next big thing, Silicon Valley story, of course it wasn't the next big thing. <laughs> uh, it didn't work out. Uh, but in that process, I met um, a guy named Kevin Rose, who ended up being one of the co-founders of the company that we would go on and start called Milk. Wow. So it was probably 2011-ish where, you know, we, you know, we start a company, raise venture capital and started building products. And, and that was kind of like the first one. What was the products you were selling? So it's funny when we had this idea of, we wanted to build something cool. We didn't know what it was. So we raised money for what we called like a lab. So the idea was we would come up with ideas, test them out. And if we found one that stuck, that would be the company. <laughs> okay. So we didn't actually start the company with an idea of this is what we're going to do right. other than we're going to come up with ideas. And the first product we built was called Oink. Um, and the idea was it was a mobile app where you could rate things at places. So if it's like Yelp. Yelp. So Yelp lets you rate the place. We let you rate the thing at the place. Oh, so if you were looking like for this the, dish is really good. Exactly. Or if you're like looking for the best burger, it might not be at a burger shop. It might be at a steakhouse. It might be somewhere else. Um, when you sit down at a restaurant, how do you know what to order? We were trying to solve for that. Dude, I think that's a great idea. I Now that I think of that, I'm like, I've thought about the like, who, okay, who's got the best pepperoni pizza? Who's got the best, who's got the best whatever, right? And if I just had a ranking of not the place, but like, this is the best flavor, you know, that'd be kind of cool. So I totally agree. We started a company. <laughs> we thought it was a really great idea. The challenge is there isn't a database of all the things. So when someone comes to the first restaurant or a restaurant that hasn't been added, you're like, hey, could you add what you ate as an appetizer and then also add your main dish and then also add the beer or the cocktail you drank? And so we, it was just a really small number of people that were creating content. So it was gonna be a really long game. And I just remember at one point, my co-founder and I were sitting at a restaurant and we were like, oh God, we gotta use our app. 
<laughs> and it was like, man, if we don't want to use it, maybe, <laughs> this maybe a, this is not the right thing. Yeah, it's a headache to do this for them. Yeah. And around that same time, we were having a conversation with the team at Google building their social product, Google Plus. And Which also didn't work. Also didn't work. Uh, <laughs> failed quite spectacularly. I remember there were over a thousand people working on it. Well, dude, you know what's crazy too about just Silicon Valley and failures and startups is like Google, one of the top three most successful companies ever in existence, right? Like these guys created the search engine, man. And they've had a ton of failed products like publicly, Google uh, Plus, Google Glass. Like it, they it's, screw up. Yeah, I think Google Wallet has screwed up like four times. Like they, <laughs> they've relaunched products under the wallet money brand and each one has failed every single time. But sometimes it's just like, man, maybe you just got to stay in your lane and like, dude, you guys have YouTube, you do search. You're yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's it's that same mentality of constantly trying new things and knowing that they're going to fail. And Google is so OK throwing a thousand people behind something. Um, but when you say stay in your lane, stay your lane. The thing that it makes me think of is you've got to have a reason to build something. And this applies across every industry. But I think Google Plus was built because there was a lot happening in social. Google wanted a product to compete with Facebook. It wasn't that Google had some sort of unique insight to say, wow, if we could build this, it would be amazing. It was more like, wow, if we knew this information about people, <laughs> we could sell more ads. And if right. we knew who their friends were, wow, we could sell more ads. And so without that kind of like, you know, unfair advantage or unique offering, it's really hard to build a product and, and have it be successful. And I think even with the weight of Google, right? If, if anyone that had Gmail back, you know, 2012, they were like lighting up a red dot, trying to get every single person to use Google Plus and it still failed. So yeah. Every product still needs a reason for people to be there. And I think if you don't have that when you're building a product or a company, uh, it's not going to win in the long run. Yeah. You just can't be like, oh, well, this is hot. Me too. Yeah. Like, let me jump on this. You might in the short term, but in the long term, the companies that win are companies that have some sort of competitive advantage, uh, brand advantage, something like that. Well, and it just seems like even with social media, they're usually can only be one for like whatever that specific style of content is like Facebook. Okay. What I don't even know what you would define Facebook as anymore, but it's just a big database of old people essentially. Uh, Instagram. Okay. It's like, that's the trendier, you know, millennial type app and TikToks even younger, but their, their videos are so different and captivating than anything Instagram or YouTube has ever done. And so now they're, they're copying TikTok. But it just seems like if somebody just tried to make another YouTube, it would fail. Like, why? We already have YouTube. Yeah. And, and honestly, if you look <laughs> back at early Google+, Plus, the, the features that differentiated from Facebook weren't things that drove user value. And, like, if you can't have value to users, why are you going to use it? Yeah. Um, and, and they probably could have built a really niche social product. I remember Google+, Plus and its integration with Google Photos was, like, really popular in the photography community but they weren't trying to be a photography app. They were trying to be like a social network for the world. Yeah. And yeah, in that case, I think there wasn't enough of a vision for how that was different and it didn't work. Got it. So, okay, you, you start this this company, Milk, yep. and Oink doesn't go too well because you don't even want to use it. Yeah, I mean, we had a really passionate user base, but in in the game of startups, you know, we weren't looking for singles or doubles. Like we were looking for home totally. runs. Yeah. And so so and what happens after that? So we'd been talking to the team at Google Plus and they said, look, we, we want someone to help us build this social product and see where we can take it. And so ultimately that conversation accelerated to let's just buy milk. And so we sold milk to Google and four of us went over to Google Plus and we started working on Google Plus. <laughs> okay. So you guys, first off, I have so many questions about this. So my mind just kind of races, but you go from being a startup founder to selling to do, do people even really get mad? Like, I guess in that world of like being a quote unquote sellout, is that like a thing? Yeah, definitely. So people are like, well, you could have built something big. I think when something's really working and you sell early and especially, you know, in the future, the company you sold it to shuts it down. They're like, man, you sold out. You had such a good product. There were probably a hundred, 500, a thousand users that were like, man, this was such a cool product. I can't believe you got rid of it. But like, it wasn't, it wasn't working. Uh, it didn't see that kind of like huge yeah. inflection point of growth. Um, 
So I think in that case, they're like, oh yeah, good job. Like the thing wasn't working and you managed to sell the company. That was yeah. great. So explain to me that. Why would Google even want to buy something that's not working? Honestly, Google wanted to buy the team of four people that came over to work. And right. like, that was it. We shut the product down. Google might've had access to the code for the app, but like, I promise they It was they purely never just like it. buying employees. It was buying four people. Yeah. And my co-founder, uh, Kevin Rose, had started a really successful site called Dig back in the day and had been kind of a really well-known product builder. And my co-founder, Daniel Burka, was a designer and he was the first person to sketch the Firefox logo back in the day, like wow. a fantastic designer. So they were like, wow, if these people can build social products, maybe they can help us build what we want Google With Plus Google to become. Plus. So Google Plus was already going when you guys joined. Yeah, it was, I was a product manager at Google Plus. I was one of 100. So and there were 1,000 plus people working on it. 1,000 <laughs> Google Plusers. Yes. So, I mean, we obviously know how the story of Google Plus played out, but like, what was it like during that time? So I think the unfortunate thing and is that Google brought in the four of us, and I think they had the idea of, wow, these people might have ideas, but didn't empower the decision-making to us. And that's fine. But at the end of the day, if you wanted our feedback or ideas or ability to shape the product, but you're not gonna listen, like it doesn't matter. And there were other people calling the shots. And so very quickly um, we realized, well, if we're not gonna have the influence and impact we want here, like maybe this isn't the right spot for us. Right. And so the Google Plus adventure for me and my co-founder Kevin lasted about three or four months. Oh, wow. So what, what did Google put you on next after that? So one of the venture capital firms that I'd raised, um, some of the money we raised at Milk was Google Ventures. So I kind of went over to Google Ventures and said, hey, you guys must know Google pretty well. Can you help us find another home here? Like we're excited to be at Google, but Google Plus isn't the place for us. And they were like, well, Kevin, my co-founder and, and the CEO of Milk, he had previously angel invested in like some of the best companies around square twitter like he was a really great picker so they were like well kevin's a great picker and you spent the last three years going to like every event in silicon valley meeting <laughs> every single person why don't you come over and be like the person in the mix going to the events finding the early stage companies kevin come over also you guys can kind of do the early stage investing that we haven't done as much of as we'd want and so we were like oh okay so like, you know, a little bit of negotiating internally at Google and a few months later, or maybe it was weeks, we're over at Google Ventures and we're doing venture capital. Crazy. And I've, I've actually read about Google Ventures. Um, I just finished a book called Super Pumped, which is the story of Uber and kind of the rise and fall of Travis. Uh, I don't know how to say his last name. Kalanick. Kalanick. Um, and it's interesting because you were there at that time when Google Ventures kind of you know, invested in Uber or maybe after the fact, but like, what was it like doing that? Yeah. I mean, the Uber deal was like one of the most interesting things because Google Ventures, one, had typically written small checks. Uh, so, but ultimately the Uber check, I think was maybe 10 times bigger than any check we'd ever written. Like 200 something, 200 million. something million dollars. I think by the end with all the, it was maybe over $300 million. And then they made... 10x that. Yeah, if least. you look at the return, it was over $3 billion. $300 um, million to $3 billion. I know. That's and, the, it, and, and that was late, right? We got in at the Series C. The investors like Chris Aka, who got in at the seed round or earlier, like those guys made way bigger returns uh, on much smaller investments. Crazy, dude. Yeah, so that one was a particularly crazy one for me because Meanwhile, I, I, I might have looked in my career like someone who worked at a startup, worked at another startup, went to Google, started another company. That entire time, my wife was working at Lyft. <laughs> and she was like employee number five or six at Lyft. And so she'd seen the entire ride sharing wars and ride and everything straight from the inside. So, you know, unfortunately, when the Uber deal was happening, people were like, hey, you can't be a part of this because, you know, your wife is, is pretty senior and well-connected at Lyft. So we can't really tell you what's going on at Uber. Um, but, you know, the, the Uber, Lyft, and, and there was a company called Sidecar back in the day, which was another competitor. Like those wars, if you, you know, I don't know if there's a better word to use in the early days, were crazy. Yeah. I mean, just reading that book and hearing the way they talked about how cutthroat Uber was with 
they like, dude, that dude, Travis just wanted to see lift destroyed. Like he was willing to do whatever it took to destroy him. I think one of the <laughs> most like iconic moments of th that kind of brings that to life was anyone that was around when Lyft was getting started, they had pink mustaches on every car. Right. And like, it couldn't be a more opposite brand. They're like, Hey guys, we got yeah. the pink mustache on our car. Uber's and, black and yeah. like, just, yeah, you know, we want to really destroy you. Yeah. And I remember seeing a, you know, those trucks that have ads on them, like their sole purpose of the truck is to drive through the city and show an ad. Yeah. I, I have my face on some of those trucks. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was an ad with a pink mustache with a razor blade going right through the middle of it. And it was the moment I was like, this is going to be a fun thing to watch. What was, I mean, what was it like? You know, your wife has got to be coming home like, dude, you know, these Ubers just terrorizing us with all these stupid things they're doing. Yeah, I mean, Ubers. Because they were playing so dirty. They, I mean, I remember my wife had a meeting once where someone from Uber, someone from Sidecar, they were all at the Lyft office. And she caught one of the Uber people trying to, like, take photos of whiteboards in conference rooms. And, like, it was, a, it was pretty crazy. Um, I think ultimately that culture is created by by the t early founding team. And, you know, sometimes that culture is what it takes to succeed, but it, it might not be what it takes to sustain. Sometimes you have to replace people as what happened in Uber. Um, but look, Travis started a really big company and not too many people know that uh, Ryan Graves, who's a good friend of mine, he was actually the first CEO of Uber. Right. He has one of the most amazing wealth building stories ever, which was, Travis posted on Twitter. He's like, hey, I need someone to help run a company. And Ryan's like, hey, could, could I do that? Yeah. I'll, I'll do that. And next thing you know, he's the CEO of Uber. You know, he did better than Google Ventures did when it comes to making a return. He didn't put, he put time, time in and Billionaire. Made, made lots of money doing it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and Ryan's the nicest guy ever. And so it's not entirely always the founder. It's it's that early team. But man, they, they had a culture of, do whatever it takes to get something done. And they built a really big company around that, but you know, it has its downsides as well. Yeah, for sure. And you know, at the end of the day, it's good that Lyft was able to withstand all that and, you know, be where they are today. Because I mean, me as a consumer, every time I'm ready to go, I check them both. I'm like, Hey, how much is Uber? How much is Lyft? And then I'll pick whatever's cheapest or whoever, you know, if somebody's going to take 20, 30 minutes to get here, oh, let me go check the other. Okay, great. Somebody can get here in five, 10 minutes. Like, cool. Do you actually check both or is it like if it's long? Because I feel like you're successful enough that it's like the dollar difference no, probably doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. So like what I'll first do, and so I'm biased. I just pick Uber. It's just like the first thing to mind. So I'll go on Uber and I'll be like, okay, you know, whatever. It's 20 bucks. Looks like it's going to be here in 10 minutes. I'll just book the Uber. But if I see it and I'm like, let's say that same ride that should be 20 bucks, like 50 bucks because they're during high fees or whatever. I'm like, oh, heck no, dude. I, I'm not paying 50 bucks for this. Yeah. So I'll check lift. Okay. Yeah. But time time is the most important. If either of them are taking an extra 10, 20 minutes, I'll just pay more. And you ever take a cab? No. Okay. I don't know. Because Vegas is like, Vegas was one of the hardest cities for Uber and Lyft back in the day. The taxi commission was crazy. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I I've just never even, well, and I think it's why Uber's successful, right? Like it, the whole model of them not having to buy cars and stuff is genius, right? Like that's, that's a huge part of it. But I think the convenience of the app, like, I don't even know how I'd order in taxi right now. Like I'd Google Las Vegas taxis and I, I don't even know which company's good or what they charge or any, like, I think that's why there's the convenience. Yeah. So it's crazy, man, just hearing that story. But what what else was it like working at Google Ventures? I mean, we probably, in the three years I was investing there, uh, did maybe 300 investments. Wow. So I was probably reviewing, I don't know, at least 20 or 30 pitches a week. So uh, you would just sit in while they pitched you? I mean, it would even start with email. So it's like, first there's an email, and you're like, do I even want to talk to this person? And then it's like, okay, I want to talk to him. Let's do a call. Oh, did I like the call? Maybe let's have them do come in and talk to us. Maybe bring in one other person. Like there was a, a funnel to get from the 30 a week down to, you know, on average, I think we saw maybe two to four deals a week that where the team would come in, the whole partnership would hear the pitch and we'd make a call on the investment. Is it very similar to like Shark Tank? similar sure there, there's a bunch <laughs> of people listening to a pitch um you know 
in, in our case, there's always, it's just us. And so there's no competing with anyone else yeah, in the yeah. room. Um, but yeah, the founders are coming in. I think that Shark Tank likes to make it a lot more about the product. Like at, at a certain size, it's a lot more about the business. Um, and so, and, and at an earlier size, it's a lot less about any of that. It's the founder. Yeah. So I would always say when I was looking at companies, I would look at three things. I was like the founder, the size of the market and the traction. Yeah. And I needed two, right? If they, if they had traction and the market was huge and maybe I wasn't certain that founder was like magical, that was probably the hardest two of three. But if it was a great founder in a big market or great founder in traction, but like the market might need some tweaking in the future, that's fine for an early stage bet. Yeah. Like you can't go in and, and make a bet in the early stage on anything. And you know, there are a lot of companies with no traction. Like here's my deck of what I want to start. Here's a couple slides. Can I have $2 million? But from the sound of it, you would rather no traction, but great founder, great, you know, size for the market. Cause that absolutely, you know, I like mean, he's going to figure it out. Yeah. The, the companies that I think we, I was most excited about the deals were when I would meet a couple founders and be like, these guys love what they're building. They, ha they understand the market in, that they're working in and they have a really big idea. And I guess the, like the other thing that's an important requirement, it's, it, it just is a requirement is they have to have the ability to build it. They don't have to build it, right? If, if you're coming to me and like, I'm not an engineer, no one on my team's an engineer, I've never hired an engineer, but we're gonna build an app. I'm like, eh, I don't know if I wanna fund that company. <laughs> but if you're like, we have one person that can build this thing, one person that can sell this thing, and one person that can like, you know, build, build the company and run it, that, you know, I'm, I'm in if you're passionate about it and I believe in your story. Right. So with these founders, one thing I've been reading, um, I read the Uber book. I read, um, the WeWork book about Adam Newman. And one thing that seems clear to me about these founders is like, man, if they're a good salesman and they're charismatic, like it's, it seems like they could sell these VCs anything. I mean, in some ways, yes. In the early days, like you're not selling anything other than yourself. So right. yeah, if you can convince someone that you're the right person to build this, that's what it takes. And if I were to coach an early stage founder on, you know, their pitch, it would be all about storytelling and sales and, you know, building charisma and that kind of stuff. It wouldn't be about what chart to put in your deck. No. It, the charts you're selling didn't even a matter. vision. Yeah. The charts, yeah. like if you have charts in your first round where you haven't even raised money and you haven't built a product, like this I, is just garbage. Yeah, I'd look at it and be like, dude, are you serious? Like, you have nothing. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's storytelling. And and that continues because, you know, when you're raising money, you're not raising money for the business you have today, you're raising for where it will go. And so, you know, I remember I invested in this company called Clever, educational technology company. And their first business was, it turns out that almost every school out there has a different database for students. So when they wanted to use software, which was growing in popularity uh, in schools, like every school uploaded a PD or a Excel file with all the students and the software. So they built this thing that tied into all the student databases. And that was the vision when they raised their first round. When they raised their second round, that business was doing great. They didn't even talk about it. They talked about how they wanted to be like Facebook connect for education, where mm -hmm. you would just, the student would have an ID with cover and that. So each time you're raising money, you're still selling a vision. It's just for like that next step of where you take the business. Yeah. And it's like the most important skill. Yeah. I remember, uh, reading the Instagram book. I've been reading a lot of tech books. Like that's yeah. why I was super hyped to, <laughs> to have you on. Um, and he, they talked about how Instagram was first called bourbon. You know, it was like an app that you, you actually know the, uh, yeah, the yeah, Kevin's sister. I mean, it was just an app and, and the yeah. thing people loved was taking photos. Yeah. It was just, and then they realized, dang, people really like these photos. We should just only do that. Yeah. And then it was just a photo app. And that, that pivot is something that great founders will be able to accept. They're like, man, I had this vision for this thing. People really like this thing. Great. Throw away the old vision. Here's a new vision. Yeah. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do because, you know, they just told everyone how great this thing is going to be. But man, when you have that like little bit of traction that you can start to see that people love something, um, Andy, the CEO of Wealthfront, uh, coined the term product market fit. And, and when we talk about what we're looking for, it's like people pulling the product out of your hands. And so once you have a product where people are like, how do I get off this wait list? How do I get this product? Can I share it to my friends? How do I get, when will you build an app for Android? Cause it's only iOS. Like that's when you know you have something and great founders will throw away whatever they thought the company would be to chase something that people are desperate for. And that works really well. Yeah, no, I'm with you, man. Uh, I forgot what CEO said it, but 
essentially it was like the sign of an intelligent person is one who's willing to change his mind like tomorrow, you know, because yeah. they get new information. And they're like, look, I, I know I said this yesterday that <laughs> I was all in on this, but I'm changing my mind and I have no ego about it. Like, it's just, this is the path we have to go. Yeah. Strong beliefs, loosely held. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like, I And I see myself as that. I've changed my mind many times over the years. Uh, I thought YouTube and all this stuff was stupid for like my entire life. And then I finally got a piece of information that made me change my mind. I was like, I'm all in guys. I don't have any followers, but guess what? I'm a YouTuber. And, <laughs> but that's what founders are doing. Like, yeah. Hey, we don't have anything going on, but trust me. Like I have a plan. I have a vision. Here's why it's going to work. And that'd be like the pitch. Yeah. And I mean, we were talking earlier about crypto and it's like, I feel like I heard you say, I went really deep. I pulled out like, yeah. you know, you, you could be as excited as you want, but willing to change. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's really important. Yeah, for sure. So I also want to talk about, uh, you know, the other big requirement that these VCs have. But before we get into that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. Have you ever wanted to invest in real estate, but you didn't have the time to find deals yourself? That's where Fundrise comes in. Fundrise is a crowdfunding platform that has transacted over $5 billion in real estate and has over 150,000 active investors. While many funds, like my own, require accredited investors, Fundrise allows anyone to invest with as little as $500. If you'd like to learn more, check out Fundrise.com. Once again, that's Fundrise.com. A quick word from our sponsor. One of the best ways to get off-market real estate deals is through cold calling. And if you want to reach as many people as fast as possible, then you need Batch Dialer. With their predictive dialing technology and built-in CRM, Batch Dialer is one of the top dialers in the industry. You can switch between single or multi-line dialing, as well as do voicemail drops and call recordings. And for being a listener of The Ryan Pineda Show, you'll get a seven-day free trial. Just go to batchdialer.com slash Ryan. Once again, that's batchdialer.com slash Ryan. Now, back to the show. So one thing that I see constantly in the startup world is everybody's just pricing in failure. It's like nine out of 10 or maybe more are going to fail. And it's like Google, especially Google Ventures, is just looking for the next Uber, the next home run. And so they just want to spread all their bets across. Like you, you did 300 companies and they just need a couple of them to pan out. Yeah. I mean, almost every fund that's wildly successful you know, you're lucky if you have one deal that returns the, and usually it's one deal returns a fund. Every now and then there's a fund like Benchmarks funds or Sequoias or lowercase where they had like multiple, you know, fund returning outcomes. And those are when you get three, 4,000 X, you know, returns <laughs> on your fund or, you know, and, and that's rare. But yeah, I mean, most people always talk about the deal that returned the fund. And so the whole game is how do you get that next Airbnb? Dropbox, Uber, any of those kind of companies. So what do you think made those guys so successful? Like how were they able to identify those companies when no other funds could, do you think they got lucky or do you think that there's something they're doing different? I mean, picking is, is like a skill that, uh, as you talk to experienced venture capitalists, it's something you, you learn, you learn how to kind of hone that ability to see through the noise, identify which founders kind of really have it in don't. And, um, it, it's a, it's definitely a skill. I, I like, I totally believe that there are great venture capitalists that can pick better than others. Do I think there's luck involved? Sure. No one knew how big any of these companies would be. Um, but being able to understand the vision and, and see where someone might be able to take it and believe in that passion early on is, is a level of risk taking that most people aren't comfortable with. Um, and it's been really cool to see it on both sides of the table. Yeah. So I guess for me, what would you suggest is like the most important thing with picking? Like, is it the founder, somebody that you trust that can shift? Is it the idea? Because I think a lot of people think that, oh man, I got this great idea. But me being in business and opening many of them, I realize the idea is cool, but there's not like, like executing the idea is like a thousand times harder than the idea. A hundred percent. I mean, you <laughs> run a brokerage firm, right? Yeah. And there are lots of brokerage firms. That's not like a new thing. Yeah. And you built a really successful one. And it wasn't because you had an idea to run. Like everyone, there's a lot of people. <laughs> it's that it's have not a, original. <laughs> yeah, not original at all. So it's all about execution. And, you know, we, when people would come to us and say, oh, can you sign an NDA so we can pitch you our company? 
we were like, no, we're not going to sign an NDA. You, like, you don't have anything we haven't seen. Yeah. And like, <laughs> if you, our reputation is like the most important thing as an investor. Like, if you can't get the next deal, that's a problem. So we're not going to go tell other people about your deal. And also, the idea isn't that exciting. Yeah. Now, sure, if it's super late stage and you want to show us this product that's, yeah, I remember we invested in Nest before Google acquired them. And it was like a very private thing because they wanted to show future products. But outside of some rare cases, like, that's not a thing that the idea doesn't matter. Now, I care that the idea is in a market with lots of opportunity. Right. Like, I'm not excited about an idea that sounds silly. Um, so I care that it's an idea I'm excited about. I more care that it's an idea that the founder is excited about. But the founder's passion, ability to build something, like it kind of all comes together in a way that there's not like a matrix to fill it out, right? right. Like you can't just like plug it in into an algorithm and pick the best founders. Right. Um, I've heard people do studies on whether repeat founders who've been successful before are better than founders that have started from the beginning. And I think like by a slight margin, yes, but not so obviously that you should always pick one versus the other. Right. No, I'm with you. So- Okay, selfishly, I have to ask this question. Okay, take me, for example. Um, I do see myself getting into the tech world at some point. Um, this is why I'm reading all these books, to understand the game and who the players are and how they did it. So if I was going to go start up an app, right? All right, I get the idea. I don't even know what the idea is yet. But, okay, you know, you're betting on me, like we talked about. Um, we don't have any traction yet because the app doesn't exist. But I figure out the idea. I know I want to do an app. What's like my first step? Like, how do I go and reach out to Google Ventures and all these other guys? Do I book an appointment? Do I email them? And I'm like, hey, my name's Ryan. I've got all these other successful companies, granted, that aren't tech. But how, how would I do that? I mean, there's lots of ways. I would say the one thing I always tell people is, look, there are a lot of things you got to do when you run a company that are hard. And there's a lot of grit and hustle and sales that goes into running a company. So... If you can't find a way to get an introduction to some firm, like yeah. that's probably correlated with that's the likelihood already of that the filter that it's not going to work. Um, but you know, there's a lot of incubators like Y Combinator and 500 startups, and and that I say would be a gr a better path to guarantee that you will get exposure because you've joined something that all these investors are already you know exposed to. Um, but the thing you said that you or that you didn't say was you've got an idea for an app. The question is, how are you going to build the app? I would almost never invest in a company that was like, hey, we got an idea for an app, we're gonna hire a team to build it. Yeah. Like the ability to iterate the product, to move faster than your competition is inherently, inherently needs you to be able to own that product development experience. Right. And the technology is oftentimes more important, even if on face value it's not, it is. And there are subtle features in every app that you've used that wouldn't have been possible if the companies didn't own the development team. So I'd say if you're out there and I've gotten so many emails from people like, I have an app idea, I wanna start this company, should I raise money? I'm like, how are you gonna build the app? And so yeah. if you can't show how you're gonna build it and ideally have built it, like you you get a pass when you you know have a bonus in a category. So for you, you can come in and say, look, I have an audience. Well, that's a plus. Yeah. So you might get a pass that you haven't built the app yet. But if you don't have anything, you've got to demonstrate some traction. So if you've had success before, maybe you can get away without having built the product. Um, but in that case, I would say, like, prove that you can build the product. So, and, yeah, and what you're saying is it's way easier for me to go just, I can self-fund it. You know, that's not an issue. Go self-fund the app, throw my own skin in the game, and then come to you with the app. I'm like, here's the app. We haven't launched it yet, but it's it's ready to go. We need more money to do marketing X, Y, Z, right? Yeah, and I think that the challenge would be, there are a lot of apps right now, right? There's a lot yeah. of podcasts, a lot yeah. of apps, but thank you, you guys are here. Yeah. Um, how are you going to build something that people want? And sometimes you use an app and you're like, this is gonna work. Um, like you just feel it as an investor and you're willing to take a bet. And sometimes you're like, I don't know, I need to see traction. And so I felt bad because there were some founders that didn't have traction and we'd invest in their apps. And there's some founders that were like, we'll invest once you have traction. So we were like, well, we're looking for like 100,000 uh, in monthly revenue or 100,000 active users. So like, and for a seed round. Now, we also did deals where the people haven't even built the app. So like, right. there's no rule, but I would say, I wanna see some traction if using the app doesn't make it so obvious how this is gonna be huge. Right, right. No, so, that makes and, and with your audience, I would be like, go launch that product. 
let's get some come, feedback. Come back and say, here's people ripping it out of our hands. Like our servers are crashing every night because we can't keep the app up. Can you give me money? VCs love that story. Yeah. Right? You go to them and say, we I have, have a thing too much demand. Exactly. Like, yeah. Come to someone with that. Raising money will be easy. Yeah, for sure. Well, and to like we're talking about these VCs, they only want, I mean, is it safe to say billion dollar ideas? I think the potential for it. Yeah. Um, you know, to your Uber example, when Uber started, they had a big vision, but the core product was like, you know, ride sharing with black cars. There weren't, yeah. you know, there wasn't this like mass market of other people's cars. Uh, Lyft on the other end started with like being the replacement for the message board at college to do long distance ride sharing. So I think it, it's like a million dollar space um, in that like transportation. If you're successful here, your business will expand um, and you will be able to be like a, in a, a small company. niche within transportation. And then you'll figure out how to get other pieces of that marketplace. Yeah. I think if you would ask the Airbnb founders, you know, they wanted to, you know, create global company with, with, you know, stays around the world. But like the first implementation of it wasn't, we're going to replace Marriott, you yeah. know, like, yeah. Um, but that might've been a long vision and, and yeah, being like able to connect maybe the, the pie in the sky of like, dude, one day we could do it, but yeah. you know, like, let's focus on this. This'll be how we start and make money. And over time we can expand. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is have some type of short term path to making money. Yeah. Well, Growing the users or making money. Whatever it looks like, just getting some kind of, you know, revenue or user base. Yeah. Got it. I will say it will blow your mind as a, a non-venture backed business person to see how many companies just burn money every month. Like, it's almost like no one cares if the company is losing money now, if there's a path to being really huge or making lots of money. So Uber, Lyft, like they lost so much money every year for almost a decade. Yeah. Um, and that was fine. Um, because now only after being public are these companies like, let's figure out how to not lose money every month. <laughs> we got to make our shareholders <laughs> some money now. Yeah. But like it, they, they could go public without even figuring that out. Yeah. Dude, tech is crazy, but I, I've seen that so many times, man. So yeah, you know, you, you got your, your teeth and everything just sharpened with working at Google ventures. Eventually you end up leaving to start a new company. Yeah, so I had seen uh, in the financial space, so many of my friends have no clue what they're doing with their money. Yeah, um, It seemed to be like, as someone who has always been like a money hacker and thinking through all of this, I was, I was always asked like, oh, what should I do with my money? Where should I invest? How should I invest? Should I buy a house? I was getting all these questions and I was like, gosh, it seems like there's an industry of people like financial advisors. Shouldn't people go to them? Yeah. And so I thought, what if, why aren't people going to financial advisors? Oh, they're really expensive or they're pushing crappy products. I thought, what if you could build software to make those advisors efficient? And so I started a company called Grove to do that. Um, we raised like $10 million. We had 20, 25 employees, a team of financial advisors. And we had about half of our money still in the bank when it became really clear that the consumer was not willing to pay enough to justify a human being a part of the product. And so we'd built a business on software will make a human efficient. And the market was saying human can't be a part of the product. And so in terms of how much it costs us to acquire customers. Right. Um, and so we were like, wow, the math do doesn't work. It didn't work. So we thought, okay, do we keep trying and burn through another $4 million? Or do we find a company that we think is building something that takes advantage of the insights that we learned? And why don't we go there and build something bigger? And I met, you know, so that's a fast forward through a, yeah. a very stressful time of hiring people and raising money and, you know, all that. But ultimately we ended up um, talking to like 30 companies and I, I didn't even think Wealthfront would be a good company to talk to because, you know, they were totally automated. But when I met the CEO, Andy Ratcliffe, I was like, oh my gosh, like the vision you have for the future is like taking the insight that we just learned the hard way and like bringing it to life. I was like, we have to go do this. Like yeah. I, I told my investors, I was like, this company needs to go to Wealthfront. And you know, me and, and a handful of those employees are still there building what we think is the future of you know, how you manage your money online and build wealth. Right, so you're now just you know, head of new product development at Wealthfront, just thinking about the new ways to do it. And you and I talked off camera a little bit about it, like you know, thinking about how can we incorporate crypto and some of these other assets, right? 
Yeah, so Wealthfront has traditionally been a investing platform to make it really easy to invest in the market. Right. So instead of picking stocks, which I think all the data shows that active stock pickers in the long run, on average, lose way more money <laughs> than passive stock investors, um, you know, we're going to make it really easy and use software to automate things like rebalancing and capturing losses to l save money on your taxes and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so we built that product and just a few weeks, months ago, we added crypto. So now you can build a portfolio that not only includes the stock market and the bond market, but crypto, and you can just automate it all. And so the product I spent the first year at Wealthfront building was this product called Autopilot, where we would basically make it really easy for you to say, hey, I'm gonna save 300 bucks a month, take care of it. And we would say, great, we'll make sure you always have 20 grand in your emergency fund. We'll make sure that we max out your IRA and then we'll just invest the rest. And you don't have to think about it because I, I think that like the best savings hack is just automate your savings because I think you're going to probably make more money focusing on things like your career, that make you money, <laughs> building a business. Yeah. So automate your savings, automate your investing and spend your time on other things. Right. And I think we've built what I think is the best way to automate your investing strategy and savings strategy. I use it myself. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And it's funny, man, because I, I preach a similar message of, look, just don't worry about picking the next stock. And like that stuff is so irrelevant. Like worry about figuring out how to make a lot of money. Yeah. You know, whatever it is for your money making skill. So I'm with you on that. You know, another question we, we talked about um, prior to jumping on the show was, I was like, how, how are you dealing with working for somebody? Cause like, how, you know, I see these startup founders with entrepreneurial spirits and then they get acquired or, you know, the startup fails. So they go and work for another company. Like, how's that been? Yeah. I mean, so when we got to Google, uh, we made that mistake the first time, right? Three months in, we were like, this doesn't work. We, we don't get to kind of flex our entrepreneurial spirit. Right. And the two things that made it possible at Wealthfront were one, a culture where people are able to create ideas and build products coming from the ground up. Some startups, the founder is like, every idea will be mine. I will define the roadmap. This is what we're building. I would have done horrible at a company like that. <laughs> um, but Andy was like, look, I think people have good ideas all across the company. Anyone can have a good idea. You don't even have to be on the product development team. Let's find good ideas, test them. And if they're great, let's build them. And so that approach combined with Andy's just like sheer, you know, raw intellect and ability to, you know, just God, he's a wealth of knowledge, um, you know, made it very easy because I knew if I had a great idea, Andy would be open to letting me pitch it to him. And if he didn't like it, he would be able to convince me why it was probably not worth doing. Yeah. So I truly feel, which is rare, that if I have an idea, I'm empowered to build something amazing. And the only reason we wouldn't pursue it is if it was a bad idea or it didn't work. Right. And that's made it possible for me to work at a company. But man, I, I imagine that there are only a handful of companies I could work at and not have that itch yeah. drive me out the door in the first three months. Yeah. You have the freedom to, you know, come up with cool things that they'll listen to. And yeah. I think for those, I don't know if you mentioned earlier, but Andy was the founder of Benchmark, which, uh, is one of the biggest VC funds, most successful. Yeah, definitely most successful. Maybe by not trying to be the biggest. Like yeah. when some funds are out there saying, wow, we raised $200 million. SoftBank. Yeah, <laughs> they, they were like, we're not gonna do that. Yeah, um, the most best ROI. But man, they've yeah. gotta be in the top five, if not top two of returns all time. Right. Fantastic fund. And the fact, so it's like, man, if you come from that background, then you understand your employees have good ideas and other things, like you might as well let them do them. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, Andy, Andy is not someone who thinks his idea is always the best, and that makes it fun to work there building products. Right. So the only reason all this works, too, is the fact that you enjoy the process of making money, saving money, hacks, and all these other things. So you, you've been talking on your own podcast a lot about hacks, and you've been interviewed about hacks. We haven't really uh, jumped into that, but tell me, tell me about this. Yeah, so I think I've kind of always been someone who bounced around I, careers, as, as we talked about. I, I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what my passion would be. And that created this mindset for me of, I don't know where the next dollar is coming from. And so 
on one hand, you could go try to find that. And, and I was doing that. On the other hand, I was like, what if I could just cut my costs crazily without sacrifice? And that led me down this crazy path of every type of optimization and looking at the biggest costs. So house hacking was a big one that we did for 10 years. Credit card points has been like a huge part of like my narrative in the last decade and probably have 10 million points right now. And <laughs> we travel around the world. We fly first class. We don't pay for it. Right. Like, right. Right. I always say like, I never want to cross an ocean in coach, but I also don't <laughs> want to pay for first class. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, like I, I basically decided that there are more hacks to learn. And so I thought, let's start a show where I can interview people who found ways to optimize everything from buying a car to, you know, investing to shopping online. It doesn't matter. Like whatever aspect of their life they found a way to optimize, I want to learn about it and share it with everyone so that they can upgrade travel, life, money without spending a lot more. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I love this hacking culture. And it's funny because, you know, you're in Silicon Valley. So people think hackers and computers, but like we're, we're talking about just the normal stuff that a lot of people in my audience love, man. Everybody wants to save money and figure out a way to potentially own nice things without having to really pay for them. And I think yeah. all these apps that we've been talking about that have been created have allowed us to do that with, you know, Turo, great example. Um, it's like, man, that's starting to blow up here in the last like year, year and a half. Uh, Airbnb, I've been, you know, doing Airbnb for four years now on some of my rental properties. For me, it just started as, dude, I want a second home, you know, in Big Bear, California. And then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I'm glad there's this app called Airbnb I can use. Cause man, if it can pay for the mortgage for me and then I use it when I want total win, but then it ends up being this thing that makes even more money and it creates cash flow and another income stream. I'm like, wow, this is nuts. And so we're like in this new age where there's so many ways to basically hack things because these apps and stuff. Yeah, I've, I'm blown away at the number of emails I get from readers. They're like, well, I found this crazy thing. And they range from like the smallest thing ever. Like there was a study that showed that if you walk through the grocery store, the opposite direction, right? Like every time you walk in the grocery store, it's very clear that they want you to go this place first and go through the aisles like this. If you just go the opposite direction, on average, you save like half or 1% of your grocery bill because they're just like positioning everything to sell you things based on this one thing. Right. So that's like a tiny, tiny little hack. Um, to like big things, like ways to think about, you know, side hustles. We had a guy from Side Hustle Nation, Nick Loper, who talked about like all these different side hustles from becoming a notary to yep. like taking online user research things. And, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, my goal is you want to make money, you want to build your wealth. You can do it in two ways. You can make more, you can spend less, but nobody wants to cut the quality of life. So how do you spend less um, without losing that quality of life? There's a lot of ways to hack that. And then how do you make more? And for some people, they can be successful. Like you started multiple businesses and, and some of them started as side hustles. Yep. And that's just another part of this hacking culture of putting together your life in a way that doesn't fit the norm of like, well, if I want to sit in first class, I have to pay for it. And if I want to own a house, I have to be able to afford the whole house. Right. We bought a house, turned a bedroom into a studio where someone didn't have access to our house and rented it out so that we could live in a nice house that we couldn't afford uh, because we could rent out a room right. without roommates. Right? right. Like you don't have to have roommates to rent out a room. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That's just been my nature my whole life of finding these optimizations. And everyone's like, been pushing me for a decade, like just start a podcast, share this. And at dinner, they're always like, what's your latest cool thing? And, uh, I finally did. And you know, it's been like four months and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. What's the podcast called? So it's called all, all the hacks, all the hacks, all the hacks.com. It was 12 bucks <laughs> <laughs> domain <laughs> available. It's good, man. I, uh, it's funny. I had to buy ryanpineda.com. This was like maybe four or five years ago before I had a following, but somebody had already bought it and they, wanted 900 bucks. I was like, ah, you know, I, I think it'll be worth it for 900 bucks. I just bought it. I didn't use it. I just was like, I, I think I need to own it just yeah. in case like maybe I blow up one day. Thankfully I bought it. Cause I don't know what it would be worth today. Somebody, yeah. tried whatever to you, me. it would literally be, be worth whatever you were willing to pay for. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Like the market uh, is one. Yeah. Well, dude, you know, what's funny about that is, so one of my other companies, Pineda Capital or real estate fund, um, was that way. So Somebody owned the domain Pineda Capital. You know, I bought the other domains. I'm, just in case, I bought PinedaFund.com, Pineda, 
you know, a bunch of different Pineda, like in real estate type deals. I'm like, Hey, if I can't get the domain, I'll use one of these other ones. I don't really care. So I call, I call up the guy and he's asking like 6,000 for it or something. And I go, here's the deal, dude. I am literally the only guy who's going to buy Pineda capital. What other Pineda is like creating some kind of wealth thing or real estate venture? Like it's me. So you can sell it to me today, or I'm going to use one of these other domains that I've already bought. So pick your choice. He's like, all right, all right. Like, let's make it. He's like, but you know, there's other Pinedas out there who would buy them. I'm like, no, there's not. It's me. It's not like Jones Capital. Okay. So we ended up agreeing for like 2,700 or something. But yeah, to your point, it was like a one man negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> we bought, I remember we bought a uh, oink.com, which at Milk, we had this app. And that was like a tough domain to get. Yeah. A uh, four letter word. And it basically took, you know, finding the person, harassing the person, you know, giving them, it was probably like 25 grand. So uh, I don't even know what we did with it. I don't even know what oink.com is now. Someone, maybe Google owns it. Um, but uh, <laughs> Google should own it. They bought you. Yeah. But maybe, you know, these transactions are so interesting. Like they're not going through the line item. Like, let's make sure we get the office furniture. Let's make sure we get this. Yeah. They're, they're um, a new company. Got it. There we go. Rego Digital Wallet. Yeah. I don't know who that is. Well, you can actually lease. A, a, a common thing startups do now is when someone's like, oh, I want to buy. I, I'd have the idea at Grove to rename the company to Future. So that'd be a really cool name. Yeah. Um, nobody was using the domain, but I think it was it was pretty expensive. It turns out Andreessen Horowitz ended up buying it for their new kind of content site. But uh, the way a lot of startups do it now is they're like, hey, we'll pay you. Let's say you want five million bucks or something for a domain. We'll give you like a million bucks a year for five years. And if at any time along that journey, we don't want it, like we'll just stop paying and you can have it back. Wow. So it's like a lease to own kind of deal where- But after five years, they get it. Yeah, and maybe you can ramp it up where it's like, well, the first year we'll pay 250 grand and the next year we'll pay 500 grand. Oh, that's So it kind of smart. de-risk buying a domain. That's a good hack for these VCs. Yeah, although domains don't seem to be going down in value, so like- and I mean, dude, talk about hacks, right? I've heard of domain flipping. Um, the guy who sold me that, I was like, dude, I just looked you up. He's like, dude, it looks like you, you do side hustles and stuff. We should talk. I was like, are you just like a domain dealer? Because obviously you, you know what you're doing. He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, that would be a cool like side hustle video to do. Yeah. Um, I was like, it, they just have algorithms that are looking up, you know, how much traffic a domain's getting and they just buy them up. Yep. And I'm over here thinking, one, I mean- it's it's pretty much real estate. You're just buying up these domains, sitting on them, waiting for someone to buy it. But two, with like, how much longer do you think dot com's going to be the thing? Because all these apps are dot io and other things, and they're all dot io because it's cheaper to get started, and people don't seem to care. But at the end of the day, because they know it, when, when I hear dot io, I'm like, okay, that's an app. It's a hip tech company. Whatever. Yeah, it's not big enough yet to buy the dot com. <laughs> <laughs> like at the end of the day, are, how many big companies didn't end up buying the dot com? Like you could almost find companies that are seemingly successful and buy their dot com like a year before they do. You could probably make a killing. Make make a killing there. Um, yeah, I, whenever I would buy a domain, I would always like make up a fake email address, and it would be like an email address of like a random person that's like if you, can't you look, let them know you're if, from you, the if you looked on LinkedIn, you'd be like, oh, this is like a professor in uh, Nebraska, and I'm like, oh, I want Oink for my pigs. I thought it'd be a cool site, you know, <laughs> like set up a cool site that's fun, some farm animal noises, and oh, boom, I got twenty five thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, and it's like, oh, we agreed, cool. Here's a contract. Like, <laughs> <laughs> our lawyers drew this up. <laughs> um, Dude, that's funny, yeah. it, but but it's so true. What what's another good hack that uh, you think people should know about? Gosh, I mean, right now I know there's a million of them. There's millions of hacks. One thing right now that I thought was really cool, um, you I think you've talked on YouTube about the fact that cars are kind of crazy right now. It's expensive yeah. used car markets. So this hack um, that I learned in an episode with this woman, the car chick, who has a podcast all about cars. She runs a car buying service. Was that you can sell a lease, but not like halfway through your lease. When you're done with your lease, you buy a car, let's say it's 30 grand and your residual that you have to buy, if you wanted to buy the car at the end is 20 grand. Instead of buying the car for 20 grand and flipping it, you can actually just sell the right to buy it. 
So my mom listened to my episode of my podcast. It's like one of those proud son moments. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm returning my lease next week. She was like, this is how much it cost me to buy the car. I wonder if I could sell it. So she went to Carvana and Carvana was like, we'll buy your residual for six grand. (laughs) So she didn't have to buy the car, sell it, deal with taxes. She literally just assigned the residual purchase ability to Carvana and they wrote her a $6,000 check. She did nothing. Yeah. Um, They picked up the car from her house. Like they literally did nothing. She did nothing. Um, So if you have a lease and it's coming up, I would say look online if someone will buy that car for more than you can buy it. And then don't worry about the capital of needing to buy it and flip it. Just sell the lease. Yeah. It's like the wholesaling of leases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tell people all the time, one of my favorite side hustles is wholesaling real estate. It's the same exact thing. Like you can make so much money selling paper. Yeah. It's crazy, dude. I've heard of that. I actually had a buddy who was telling me this the other day. He's like, yeah, I flipped a Ferrari before. And uh, he's like, I bought a Ferrari. Um, This was years back. And the dealer goes, hey, you should buy another Ferrari. He's like, like, what are you trying to do, dealer? Like you're... I just bought a Ferrari from you. I don't need another. He's like, no, you should buy a Ferrari because people can't buy one unless they're already an owner. And he's like, you could just flip it for so much more than what you buy it for. He's like, okay. He's like, I already got a buyer for it. Like all you have to do is just buy it and you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to fund it and all that stuff. So he basically said he, he ordered a second Ferrari. The dealer already had the buyer lined up for it. Uh, dealer made his rip. He made like 50 grand on the Ferrari. Just crazy, dude. I think there's a market that someone, (laughs) I mean, maybe these startups are getting into it, but so many people trade in cars that are worth more than the trade in value. Like, oh yeah. If you go out there and just like stand outside of a dealership and say, are you trading this car in? And like could offer them cash with like 500 bucks over the trade in value. Yeah. I bet you could flip those cars like crazy. Yeah. Oh, for sure, dude. There's so many ways to make money today with all the tech and just the marketplace. It's, it's nuts, man. Yeah. Well, dude, I've had a blast having you on. Um, we're actually going to continue this conversation on your podcast as well. So we'll yeah, definitely so check uh, it out. Link to it down below. Uh, where can everyone find you at? Yeah. So I'm, I'm at Hutchins on Twitter. I'm Chris Hutchins everywhere else. Yeah. Uh, and all the hacks.com is my show. Cool. So we'll link that down below. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on, man. I'm going to have to create my next app, but I'm going to have it already performing and ready to go by the time I go pitch it. I'm going to hit you up when uh, I do that. Cool. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you guys leave a five-star review, and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Thanks for watching The Ryan Pineda Show. If you want to work with me, head over to ryanpineda.com. You can find my courses, coaching programs, and upcoming events. We also have free resources you can download, so head over to ryanpineda.com.